To start it off, President Biden has faced increasing criticism of the way the military presence in Afghanistan is being handled. Yesterday, however, the commander in chief tried to make the issue about his decision to withdraw without owning up on the way it has been executed. In a, in a statement that surprised many observers, he even claimed that his administration had planned for an outcome like the chaotic one we've seen playing out in Afghanistan over the last few days. My national security team and I have been closely monitoring the situation on the ground in Afghanistan and moving quickly to execute the plans we had put in place to respond to every constituency, including and contingency, including the rapid collapse we're seeing now. Did he really have a plan for what we're seeing now? With me now to talk about the fall of Afghanistan is FRC's Executive Vice, Vice President, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, who was one of the original members of the U.S. Army's Delta Force and also spent the last four years of his 36-year military career serving as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. General, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much, Joseph. It's good to be with you. Well, it, it's good to be with you first. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here. There is some actual breaking news this afternoon I want to talk about. The State Department uh, has released a statement telling Americans who are currently trapped in Afghanistan that their safety to the Kabul airport cannot be guaranteed. Are we fulfilling our obligation to our citizens in Afghanistan right now? No, my personal <coughs> excuse me. My personal opinion is we are not. And if the president uh, does have a contingency for this, then I would ask, uh, why haven't you executed that contingency? Or is that contingency simply your own, your own, if you're an American or a, uh, uh, an Afghani that worked for the U.S. government? So I don't know what's going on here, but I don't believe the truth is being told here by the administration. It's difficult to believe, and I'm no military expert, that anything that we're seeing is is part of an actual plan. Nobody would have written this down, I don't think. I think what we're seeing is something of a worst case scenario. I suppose things can always be worse. Um, but President Biden made a statement yesterday. He didn't take any questions, uh, essentially doubling down on his efforts. What was your response uh, to his statement? Yeah. I, I, first of all, I'd go back to what we were just talking about. I'd question, Mr. President, do you even know what that, co that contingency plan really is all about? What does it call for? And why haven't you executed it? And, uh, and the other thing is this. Do you really understand what's happening there? Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that he does. I'm not so sure that he understands the magnitude of the 10,000 Americans that are in that country, missionaries, contractors, all kinds of people, uh, many of which are, are Afghans that have yeah. American citizenship. Do you really understand the magnitude of this? If you, if you did, you'd put enough force on the ground in there to set up zones that these people could come to and get lifted out probably by uh, CH-47 helicopters into the airport in, uh, in Kabul and, and put on transports to get out of there. We are definitely hearing different stories about what the military, what advice the White House got. Mitch McConnell yesterday, of course, uh, Republican leader Mitch McConnell was asked by a reporter about the intelligence that the president received. And here's a couple excerpts from that exchange, and then I want to give you a chance to talk about that. Okay. Do you think the, uh, the intelligence the president got was uh, insufficient or wrong? Or do you think the president uh, just mishandled it? It won't surprise you to know I was in a number of these briefings over the last couple of months. It was pretty obvious to me what was going to happen. Uh, I know for a fact that the president's military leaders argued against this decision. I think the president felt strongly about this, obviously. He overruled his own military leaders to do it, and he owns it. Do you think uh, Senator McConnell's description there is likely true? Did he over to, uh, did he overrule his uh, military his military leaders? And if so, why would he do that? I don't think there's any question he overruled his military leaders. The guy that's uh, been on the ground in Afghanistan is a guy named General Scott Miller. Scott Miller worked for me when he was a young captain. In fact, he was in Mogadishu with me during the Black Hawk Downs. 
events there, and he was a real hero as a result of that. I know Scott Miller, and I know that Scott Miller advised him that we could not pull out of, of Afghanistan the way we did, as precipitously as we did, without uh, providing for uh, the Americans and the Afghans that worked for the Americans there, without providing for their safety and security and a way to get them out. So yes, why did he do that? I think he's got a bunch of uh, Ivy League uh, national security advisors that have never been on the ground, that uh, everything is theory to them, they're not practitioners, and they're giving him some really bad advice because what they're primarily focused on is his social agenda. And that's what, the, that's what you see in the military, that's what you see in the homeland security, that's what you see in every department of this uh, administration. And I think that uh, he is listening to the wrong people, not paying attention to the right people. Uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, he appeared over the weekend on CNN State of the Union. He argued that keeping the U.S. troops in Afghanistan uh, is, quote, simply not in the national interest. Do you agree with that statement? I do not agree with that statement. Now, first of all, let me go back, Joseph, and say that I think we had accomplished our objectives in uh, by January of 2002 in Afghanistan, and I think we could have left then. However, we did not leave then. We turned it over to NATO so we could prepare for Iraq, and I think that was a mistake because NATO does not fight, and we gave them the leadership of the of the coalition in there, and, and that's when things started to go south. So, but... Uh, with regards to, to what Blinken was saying there, it is in our national interest not to keep maneuver forces on the ground, not to keep forces on the ground that will be going out and searching for the Taliban, but to keep a small counter-terrorist force that can go after known terrorists when we, when we know that they are in a particular place, a, a good intel capability that is multifunctional, that covers all the bases, a, uh, a, an embassy security apparatus there, and then finally advisors with them. And that's only, that's not much more than the 2,500 we had in there. That's in the national interest. So Blinken is wrong. Afghanistan is not the only place in the world that we have 2,500 troops, is it? Oh. How many other countries do you, would you estimate that we have a military presence of that size or larger? Well, certainly the first one to come to mind is Korea. We've got much more than that in Europe, about 30,000 in Europe. We've got them in Japan. We've got them in uh, different places. Uh, we've got them down in, uh, in, in the uh, Pacific. So, no. And, and, and by the way, check how long they've been there. Yeah. They've been there since World War II yeah. in the case of uh, Europe, and they've been there since the Korean War in the case of Korea. And those aren't being described as endless wars. What I have a hard time uh, wrapping my head around is why that kind of presence, which the status quo seemed to be working, and we know that there was a lot of violence in Afghanistan. It wasn't happening lately. I mean, we hadn't have a, had a, a military service person uh, die in combat there and I believe, in a year and a half, which is sure. wonderful, of course. February so, of 20. Why was there this urgency to change the status quo if there was relative stability? Again, it's a matter of who you're listening to. And when you are listening to the people that Joe Biden has around him, people which have no clue as to the real situation on the ground in uh, Afghanistan or anywhere else, or really any situational awareness of what's important to Americans, they have an agenda, and that agenda is a Marxist liberal agenda, and they thought that it would be a good thing for him to be able to say, I got our troops out of combat. They were not in combat. They were serving in there. It's a combat zone. But as you said, yeah. we haven't lost an American since uh, February of 2020. Yeah, there are no proponents of endless war, I don't think. That's exactly uh, right. Do you think the way that this is ending um, will or should affect our ever being involved in Afghanistan? I think it's going to be a hard decision if we ever send people back into Afghanistan. Now, that said, let me say this. I don't think that we should automatically assume that al-Qaeda is going to rush back into Afghanistan because we've left. Al-Qaeda spread out all over the globe uh, after we responded to 9-11. We ran them out of Afghanistan, and they've, they're all over Africa now. They're in Pakistan. They're in Syria. They're in Iraq. And I don't think they necessarily need Afghanistan. They might do it for some propaganda purpose. But I don't think Afghanistan is going to be a, 
what it was before in terms of a, a primary safe haven for uh, the Taliban, I mean for the uh, Al-Qaeda, or any of the other terror networks. So I don't think that it's going to go back to the way it was. Let's certainly hope that's the case. A lot of analogies are being made to Vietnam right now. Yeah. Do you think what we're witnessing at the moment is evidence that we failed to learn any lessons from history? We certainly, it would appear that we did. It, it, the difference here is that uh, in Vietnam, they had almost two months to prepare. They, they knew that Saigon was going to fall. They knew that the, uh, the North Vietnamese were not going to live up to their end of the peace agreement, the Paris Peace Accord. So they had about two months to prepare for it. And you did not see pictures of Americans hanging off of helicopters or, or for that matter, Vietnamese hanging off of helicopters coming off the roof of the embassy or anything else. It was, yeah, it was a chaotic situation but we at least had done some preparation and we executed it pretty doggone well given what was going on in there at the mm -hmm. time. We did a pretty good job of getting everybody out and getting them off to carriers and that type of thing. So uh, I, I, I think that that is reminiscent. What we're seeing now is reminiscent yeah. of uh, April of 1975, but it's not the same. We've got about a minute left. What we can't do is go back and change anything. What should happen from today moving forward there? Well, from today moving forward, I think that uh, we've, we've got to, first of all, accept that we just destroyed our credibility and we've got to work real hard to restore our credibility with our allies all over the world. That may be the biggest loss. It's not just the loss of the war. It's the loss of our credibility with our allies. And, and we're actually going to talk about that in the next segment with, uh, with Bob Fu as we talk about what's going on in China because we already see a China kind of um, rattling their sabers a little bit, yep. maybe seeing opportunity. And, and it is concerning once evil people don't fear you anymore, uh, right. what they might be emboldened to do. General Boykin, as always, we appreciate your wisdom and your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph.